Last week, I filmed an entire video about building custom cables for my ASUS ESC 4000 G3 GPU server. And then my camera decided to eat all of the footage. So instead of that video, today I get to go over how I made the cables, what challenges I overcame, show you some of the testing I've already done on the server, and hopefully actually have this one make it to air. Today's video is brought to you by me. Check out craftcomputing.store for all of my official merch and help fund the content that you enjoy watching here on the channel. From custom laser engraved pint glasses to coasters and whiskey stones, and even our brand new double wall insulated coffee tumblers, all of my merch is designed 100% in-house and made to order by me. I'm also now offering flat rate international shipping to 23 different countries, and if you live in the continental US, free shipping on orders over $35. So what are you waiting for? Head on over to craftcomputing.store and start drinking like a pro. Cheers, everyone. Welcome back to Craft Computing, everyone. As always, I'm Jeff. So a couple weeks ago on the channel, I bought and unboxed an ASUS ESC 4000G3, a GPU server that I was very excited about but it had one major hurdle to overcome to get it working. And that was, it didn't come with any of the GPU power cables. So I made some, and that's what this video was supposed to be. But my camera gods had other plans, as all of the close-up footage of me explaining the process and actually making the cables, that's nowhere to be found. I thought about just recreating some of the close-up footage, but I did have some trials along the way that really couldn't be replicated if I just bought some new cables and parts and uh, reshot it. So instead, today I'm just going to explain how I made the cables for the server, tell you what parts you need, and then hopefully we can finally see what the server is capable of. Just to get you caught up, this is the ESC 4000 G3 from ASUS, a 2U server with dual 2011-3 CPU sockets, 16 DIMM slots for memory, and what caught my eye was dedicated space and cooling for up to either four dual slot or eight single slot GPUs. But I am getting a bit ahead of myself. Let's take a look at the power cables inside the server, which is where we left off last time. As I mentioned during the unboxing, the ESC 4000 G3 has a power distribution board for the GPUs. There are four plugs on each side, each using a standard EPS 4-pin header like you'd normally find on a motherboard. Unfortunately, it's not quite as simple as picking up an EPS 8-pin to a 4 plus 4-pin cable, as not all 4-pin plugs are alike. The power board uses the 4-pin type A plug, which is why I went with a 4-pin EPS extension as the base of my cables. So basically what I'm doing is I'm taking two four pin EPS extensions with the four pin type A male plugs here. I'm always confused which is male and which is female because the plug itself is male because it's inserted into those plugs, but the pins themselves are female plugs because they receive the male end from inside the female connector on the other end. Uh, I always call these the male end since the plastic part goes inside the other plastic part. Either way, there's a whole lot of coupling going on. Anyway, putting these together was fairly straightforward. I depinned the eight pin female extension along with the two male ends of the four pin EPS. I then cut and splice the male pins off of the EPS extension, terminate them with the new female pins, and then insert this into the male plugs, which I have since freed. Of course, it would have been helpful had I confirmed the polarity of ASUS's power distribution board, because the first batch of cables that I made caused the servers to refuse to turn on. As it turns out, ASUS built the power board like a DIYer's home bathroom renovation. Hot means cold and cold means hot. So I depinned my custom cables again, this time swapping the yellow and black wires around, and now everything works just fine. Now I have no idea why ASUS would decide to use a standard plug type in the four pin EPS and then just reverse the polarity on it. But now we all have a reminder to meter twice, crimp once. And now we get to my favorite part, which is actually being able to turn on the server with the GPUs installed and getting all of our virtual machines configured. Now in the unboxing video, I mentioned that I wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do as far as storage goes. Now, storage has been one of the massive and biggest bottlenecks that I've had to deal with when it comes to running multiple gaming machines on a single server. Even NVMe drives, when you try forcing 
four or six or eight streams of IO out of them, they don't actually have the bandwidth or the capability within the storage controller to feed that many simultaneous streams. Now I had a couple of different thoughts about how I wanted to go about this. My first thought was I want to run eight VMs on this 2U server and I happen to have eight drive bays up front. So why don't I just install eight 1.92 terabyte SSDs and patch each individual SSD through to its relegated VM. While that would ensure 1.92 terabytes of usable storage at 550 megabytes per second to each VM, it's also a little bit limiting in that it's still just a SATA SSD with 550 megabytes of connectivity. I would rather raid those all together and then run a virtualized disk on top of that. Now I'm going to take a hit in overall bandwidth by using a virtual drive on a larger ZFS array. However, I think the sum of the <laughs> ZFS pool with a virtual disk on it is still going to be greater than a single disk pass through itself. Also, if I ZFS rate it, I do get a little bit of redundancy. Rate is not a backup, but it does help for uptime. So I put all eight of these 1.92 terabyte SSDs into a RAID Z2 in ZFS, giving me an effective capacity of about 11 and a half terabytes of space. Now across eight VMs, I went ahead and gave each VM one terabyte to work with. That's a pretty significant hit to storage, but the results have been pretty fantastic with multiple VMs hitting that storage pool with no real relevant slowdowns to be seen. I think the biggest thing that has slowed down my storage in the past is I was focusing too much on the overall storage capacity, specifically trying to enable ZFS deduplication, where if I download one copy of a game, the other VMs don't have to download that same copy. I'm only storing one copy of that file. The problem comes in that even in a ZFS raid, that one copy is still only stored two times. And so you only get the data stream of two simultaneous copies of that data. Whereas if I'm using virtual disks on a larger ZFS2 RAID array, each virtual disk has its own copy of the data, which is spread across all eight disks. As long as I'm not trying to install eight copies of Call of Duty at 250 gigabytes per piece, I should be just fine with the storage amount that I have. But enough talk. What does the server actually look like once it's up and running? Honestly, I am blown away by the performance I'm seeing right here. Now, I'm not going to give full benchmark numbers for all of my enterprise GPUs. That's going to come in a later video where I'm actually going to catalog what is the difference physically and bifurcation wise between a Tesla M40 and a Tesla M60 and a Tesla P40 and a Tesla P100 and a Tesla P4 and a Tesla V100 and an RTX A5000. Basically any enterprise card that I can get my hands on, I'm going to run it through a set of standardized benchmarks to give you an idea of if you wanted to build a GPU server in your house for VDI or virtualized gaming, what performance should you be aiming for and what cards should you be looking to buy? But one of the biggest struggles with running VDI and cloud gaming and self-hosted you know, cloud gaming servers like this has been cooling those enterprise cards. Even running 80 millimeter blowers that have had 3D printed shrouds to pass through these cards, they still end up running at like 75, 80 degrees at 200 watts of load. One of my biggest hopes with this server being a dedicated GPU server would be to bring those temperatures down. So how are the temps when I'm running my GPUs? In a word, fantastic. So I've set up four virtualized gaming machines, two of which are connected to a Tesla M40. The other two are connected to a Tesla V100. Both of these cards have single GPU dies on them with a 250 watt total TDP. Now a traditional gaming workload usually is not going to absolutely stress the TDP limits of these cards. That TDP limit is set with the idea that you are maxing out the memory and the tensor cores and every last capability of a GPU itself. Rather, when I see a single GPU loaded up with a single VM, I see about 135 watts. When I load two VMs up, I usually see about 200 watts on these enterprise cards. And the results are pretty much identical to what I've experienced before here. On the Tesla M40, we see about 180 watts of total load. On the Tesla V100s, we see a little bit closer to 200 at times when running through some synthetic testing. And under strictly non-scientific comparisons, just based on knowledge that I've had over the last four years of reviewing these enterprise GPUs, the Tesla M40s 
only reached about 65 degrees Celsius. What's even more impressive is the Tesla V100s peaked at about 59 degrees Celsius under full synthetic workload with two VMs running. Now, yes, I was running these inside of my air conditioned server rack, but it was also 87 degrees inside my garage when I was running these tests. The temperature inside the server rack itself was about 75 degrees or so. And I have a thermal probe in place that tells me exactly the inlet temperature of the server. That's an inlet temperature of only about 24 degrees Celsius. So these GPUs at 3000 RPM with a pair of 80 millimeter blowers were running just 30 degrees above ambient. That's insane. If you've ever worked with any of these GPUs before and tried the Coulomb with non-conventional, non-server chassis means, that's insane. I, for one, cannot wait to start running all of my different GPUs through their paces and finally get some standardized results. I'm probably one of the few people on Earth with the most gaming experience on these GPUs as far as a self-hosted environment, and even I can't give you a straight answer outside of anecdotal evidence of which GPU actually performs better, which GPU is worth your money, which one would you run for max performance on a single VM, which one would you rather split into dual VMs? I don't have that answer yet, but part of the purpose of the server is so I can finally get that answer. So it has been a long and frustrating week full of setbacks with building cables and then full of more setbacks on the production side of losing the footage of me building said cables. Uh, I will show, as I probably did earlier in the video, me turning these cables into a GPU cable for this server. And I will have written instructions that I will link with full pictures down in the video description if you happen to buy one of these servers and you need to make one of these cables for yourself. Honestly, the process was fairly painless and didn't require much as far as tools go. Um, I used a basic set of, you know, Ace Hardware wire strippers. I used a pair of snips that you get with any 3D printer. And I bought this $15 crimp tool off Amazon. And this thing worked an absolute treat for crimping these Molex pins. The one purchase I did make was this D-pin tool. Now this one is a fairly nice one with an aluminum body on it. Uh, I like this because I plan on doing this a lot more often, but this was about $20. You can get D-pin tools for these Molex headers for about $6 on Amazon. Links to all of the tools and parts and cables that I used will be down in the video description as well. If you're interested in any of the Enterprise GPUs or the Asus ESC 4000 G3, I will have affiliate links down in the video description. As a reminder, if you do buy anything from my affiliate links, I may receive a small kickback, which helps keep the lights on around here. So any visit to those links is very much appreciated. But that is going to do it for me in today's video. Make sure to like this video and subscribe to Craft Computing if you haven't done so already. And if you like the content you see on this video and wanna see more weird things with servers and weird projects like this, there's a couple ways you can help support the channel. Number one, head on over to patreon.com slash craft computing and join my Discord server. Minimum donation of $1 per month gets you access to the exclusive Discord server, which simply means you have to pay me a dollar if you want to troll me. Secondly, head on over to craftcomputing.store where we have everything that you need to start drinking like a pro from pint glasses and whiskey stones to coasters and bottle openers. All of it made and designed 100% in-house by me. And that's going to do it for me in this one. Thank you all so much for watching. And as always, I will see you in the next video. Cheers, everyone. That's a top five beer I've had all year. Beer for today is the same beer that I drank in the video that I already filmed once. <laughs> it is uh, from Drop Bear Brewery in Eugene, Oregon. It is the Wild Riley PA Rye Hazy IPA. When I first saw these cans, I was certain they were an Australian beer because well, Drop Bear Brewery, very Australian inspired design. No, Eugene, Oregon literally an hour away. 7.2%, uh, 50 IBU. Introducing our Rye Hazy IPA, where smooth haze meets spicy rye. Experience a captivating flavor fusion, juicy hops intertwined with delicate spiciness. A perfect balance of sweet and peppery notes that create an enticing complexity, ensuring every sip is a delightful journey for your taste buds. That's pretty much the same reason I enjoy 
rye whiskey over bourbon. I like it a little more spicy. I like that peppercorn note that it brings. And if they can do the same thing with a hazy IPA, oh, I'm on board. One thing's for certain, that is a very pretty beer. Really good color on that. Oh God, that's good. That is good. Whew. This is such a unique beer. I've had rye forward beers before. I've had ales, I've had IPAs, I've had hazies, I've had... This is an amalgamation of styles that hits on so many different levels. Obviously the, the foremost flavor in here is the rye. It's a little bit spicy. It's almost like a, like a mulled wine when it's mixed in with this IPA. It's a little bit Christmassy. It's a little bit spicy. There's a little bit of, of pepper notes to it. Being a hazy IPA, it's got a little bit of that acid. It's got a little bit of that acidic front that kind of kind of lingers in the back of your throat. But this isn't a, a mid-2010s hazy IPA. It's, it's not burning or unpleasant to drink. It's actually very smooth, very delightful. A very dry finish on this one, which kind of makes me constantly want more. I think mulled wine is the best explainer of this beer I can possibly get to. Instead of hazy, the very first thing I get up front is kind of that, that spicy note. But then it and the hazy IPA just kind of weave in and out the whole time. And then what you're left with is just the back flavor of a fairly decent hazy IPA. Like I said, it's a little bit IPA. It's a little bit hazy. It's a little bit rye. It's a little bit brown ale. I like this one. I like this one a lot.